but I believed in me and I knew there was space for me. I knew that my voice was needed in Hollywood because I honestly didn't feel like I saw me. They kept saying, oh, she too edgy. I was like, it's a lot of us out here. <laughs> uh, but also what you're missing is that I'm trained. So don't expect me, uh, when I walk in the room, I'm gonna walk in as me, okay? Cause I'm gonna be me. But I can give you whatever you want on a silver platter in that in the pages with the right check attached. <laughs> so I'm not gonna talk the way you want me to talk because this is who I am. But if I have to speak that a certain way, if it's in the pages, that's what you're gonna get. And it's gonna be served up, like I said, on a silver platter because I'm gonna do my work. But I'm gonna be me. I gotta be me. Hello, everyone. Hello. Oh, listen. All right, let's 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 bring the energy. Um, hi, my name is Angelique Jackson. I'm a senior entertainment writer over at Variety, and it is truly a pleasure and an honor to be breaking down this legendary career of Taraji P. Henson as we head into another acclaimed performance in The Color Purple. <laughs> and let's not forget, she's also already Emmy nominated this year for Abbott Elementary. <laughs> but truly, that is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this incredible actor and producer and director, and truly advocate, multi-hyphenate. I mean, why am I talking? Without further ado, I introduce Taraji P. Henson. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I receive it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I was like, I love that you're in the in the energy and the space always of receiving it. Because what I think is so amazing about you is how much you give it. So I know that you just mentioned seeing her last night. I saw you last night at what as well. And you yielded your time, you yielded some of your time to Felicia Perlin Posse, who is the young star of The Color Purple. But you do that every time. I watched so many interviews with you. And the thing that it feels like you love to do most is give other people their flowers. Why is that so important to you? And what is it like for you to be receiving so many of your own right now? I'm a giver. Um, I just am. Uh, Christmas, I show up with all the bags and everybody gets a gift, even the dog. Um, it just makes me feel good to give. I think as humans, we are supposed to be in service of each other. Um, and, you know, I've been doing this over two decades and some change. And um, it just feels good to, to hear. Because when someone goes, we love you or... <laughs> oh, woo! Really hard like that. <laughs> that means I've affected them in, in a good way. Um, and that was my prayer to God when I started out this journey, was to do work that mattered, work that would change lives for the better. I wanted women, little girls, to see themselves in me. Um, yeah. <laughs> Art is healing. It has certainly healed me. It's been therapeutic. For me, a lot of the projects that I've done have had to tap into some old wounds and open them up and deal with them, you know. So I understand the power of art. <laughs> well, let's talk about this latest powerful performance, Suge Avery. But also, there's a new element to this Shug, for those of us who have been fortunate enough to see this version of The Color Purple reimagined by Blitz Bazawule. Woo -hoo. Woo. Um, and what I feel like we get in this Shug and in your portrayal of her is a real understanding, and of course the great Margaret, Margaret Avery yeah. did a beautiful job in 1985, an iconic job, but I think there's something that you do in your work that made me, whenever I watched Suge before, I, I, I didn't feel as much like I was her. And when I watch you, and this is how I feel every time I watch you, I feel like I am her in whatever way. 
how do you do that? I mean, I guess we've got an hour and a half to explain that, <laughs> but <laughs> how do you do that? I honestly, I don't, I don't, I just set out, like I said, it's about people seeing themselves, you know? So, you know, I play these characters and I'm very particular about the characters I pick because these are women that, if not handled properly, they just come off as stereotypes. You know, Cookie, Yvette, you know, a sassy black girl, it's deeper than that. You know, if someone is loud or rambunctious or they cut you off or whatever your quirk may be with another human, there's always a reason behind that. <laughs> and I think that's what the people are identifying with, the reasons why these characters are the way they are. And I go deep, I go real deep. <laughs> yeah, because it's important. If I don't connect, how will the audience connect? You know, I like to pick roles that scare the hell out of me because there's something to overcome. There's a fear to overcome. There's something for me to learn and, and I will transform. If I'm transformed, then the audience will in some way be transformed. So if it doesn't make me shake in my boots and I'm dropped down, be like, oh Lord, why me? Then I don't do it. <laughs> Well, how did Suge transform you? Oh my God, she gave me another layer of confidence. Um, you know, <laughs> it is something to be a black woman in this industry at my age and how many seasons I've seen in this game and still be able to yet surprise my fans. You know, that's honestly a blessing. Thank God I didn't blow my wad in the early years. <laughs> But um, that's what makes it exciting for me. Um, but this Suge scared me because, you know, I don't know if you've been listening to all these interviews we've been doing, but I was tapped to play her on Broadway. I said, no. And you shouldn't pick me for uh, Sophia because I said, hell no. <laughs> mm -mm. And that's because I trained, I studied musical theater in Howard University, at Howard University. Ain't you? You know, okay, all right. I was just checking, but uh, cause we everywhere. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, but um, no. What was I saying? See, I got try. Listen, you bring up Howard, and it goes right. in a different There's, direction. Which we will get back there. We yes. will get back there. But you were you were talking about um, a bit of how you get into. Or actually, I'm sorry. You how were, she changed? Yes, me. and you were talking about specifically saying no on Broadway. Oh God, because I knew my vocals would not withstand eight shows a week. I know what it takes to sing at that capacity for eight shows a week. I wasn't ready. You know, I just wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to put in the work. I, you know, and you have to understand your instrument. There are singers out there that are just anointed. We know them. They have the voices. They wake up in the morning and they are just, <laughs> woo! You know, I'm not her. I have to, <coughs> me, me, me. I got to find the note, baby. So. <laughs> but you can find the note. Uh, well, you give me a minute. I'll get it. You give me a second, though. But, um, so, you know, when you're in a film, you know, with these incredible singers and this is what they do, you're intimidated. I was so intimidated, but I had so much support. I mean, Fantasia, you all, she's beautiful, inside and out. You know, Danielle Brooks, she, big, powerful, beautiful voice, just, she wasn't a believer, she, cause you know, she was, um, I think she was starting, she was rehearsing Fences. No, no, it wasn't Fences, it was uh, piano, uh, lesson? piano Lesson. She was rehearsing Piano Lesson, so I didn't have a lot of scenes with her, so she would leave town and I remember when we were filming Push the Button and they were playing, I had, you know, did it in the, in the, uh, studio, in the studio, so now we're using my actual voice in the track. And Fantasia kept saying, Danielle keeps coming over and be like, is that her singing? That's really her singing. <laughs> I mean, you got Gabby, you know, her, I, <laughs> Haley. I'm just like, I feel like a fish out of water, but, what I do love is a good challenge, and I always rise to the occasion. <laughs> I do know that about me, so <laughs> that's why I like to be challenged. Rise to the occasion, surpass the occasion, uh, just demolish the occasion, make a new occasion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and because you mentioned Push the Button, that is just an incredible scene in all respects, from the entrance and the costumes and the choreography. Tell me a little bit about how you um, the work that you did to make that so remarkable. 
Oh, we had us uh, about two weeks of rehearsals. I can't remember. It's all a blur now. But I left L.A. at the end of February to start filming in the middle of March sometime. I don't remember the exact dates. But uh, when I got there, it was all a series of rehearsals, which I felt at home because I felt like I was back in school, musical theater. I had my notebook, <laughs> my backpack, my snacks, because it's an all, all-day thing. It's all day, you know. It's like theater out there, you know, those tech nights. It's literally like that. So um, we rehearsed at a dance hall down the street from the studios, and... I mean, they had it working like a well-oiled machine. Some of us would be rehearsing our solos with Fatima while the others would be in fittings, and then some would be going over the, um, the script with Blitz. It was, like, it was like in school all over again. And so we did the rehearsals in a space like it was loose. You know, it's not the actual set. The camera's not there. But we kind of got it in our bodies so that by the time we got to the set, it was there and all we needed was the costume and the camera so we had lots of uh lots of rehearsal time and that's the time when you make the character yours you know um and it was fun <laughs> a lot of fun how, how did you make Shug Avery yours what what was important for you to put into her so I played Shug before in Hustle and Flow Yes, that, the, the other should. The other should. <laughs> and she was a sex worker. And you, yes, and you know this should is sexually promiscuous, is what they say. And so something about a person that gets the name Shug, which is short for sugar. And because she's known as this loud, bigger than life personality and this change maker, she comes and she lifts it up. You know, it's like she's an alien coming from outer space to these people who never made it out. Because you got to remember, this is a generation after slavery. So you're talking about people who were, you're free now. And they like, okay, now what we do? I mean, because you, you're free. Now what? You've been living on a, a plantation and somebody's been feeding you. And like, what do you do? And this woman couldn't wait to escape, you know? And um, what I wanted to lean into is, yes, we know she sleeps around and this and that and the third, but there's something very nurturing and tender about her. And so I wanted to lean into that. Like, why is she this way, you know? Um, you know she has children with Mr. that she never takes care of. Clearly, this woman has issues with that kind of connection. And that's what, and I was so grateful in this reimagining because they really leaned into the relationship between Celie and Suge, which I found is very special and beautiful the way he handled it. Because it wasn't about sex. Let's forget about that, right? Yeah, sex happens, so what? But it was about these two humans that truly saw each other. She's been with all these men, but they sexualized her because of what she does and how she looks. And she, you know, to be a performer, you give so much. It's such a vulnerable space to be in. And here she does. She travels the, uh, the land giving of herself, but who's pouring back into her? And this empty love that she's chasing is only chasing the love of her father. And each and every time, so these are the backstories, but each and every time she comes back home, this is the one time my dad's going to love me this time. Mm -hmm. She comes back with a husband. I was, we's married now. <laughs> Hopefully that's the thing that... But it's not until she really experiences true, the, the true tenderness of true love. And that's where she experiences that with, um, with Celie because she shows up sick and the man she came to see don't even take care of her. Useless. All the men that she's laid with, useless, say it, girl. <laughs> 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 say it with your chest. <laughs> And she gets here, and what does he do? Pass her off to the lady. So he's even sexualized. He slighted her twice. He didn't marry her when he had the babies, and when his wife died, he still didn't marry her. So it's sort of kind of like revenge sex, probably, <laughs> with him. But the true tenderness came in the relationship with Celie. And I'm so grateful that we are in a time, you know, because 1985, we couldn't really deal with it. 
the way it was dealt with in the Bible, that is the color purple by Alice Walker, we couldn't really deal with it. And we, we were, because we've advanced in society, um, we could open it up a little bit and really kind of deal with that. And I was happy for that. Because, you know, representation is everything. You know, that's how people end up isolating and, and suffering in silence because they think they're the only ones. That's why you have to, if you have a story to tell, tell it, because somebody out there needs to hear it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad you brought up Alice Walker's, you know, mm. classic seminal novel, um, I, because I was going to ask your your relationship to it. Because all of the things that you just said are those those little nuggets that are there. You see it, you you when you read it, you're reading it from Celie's point of view, but you you are you are bringing us that that was never a one sided love. It was a deep, true love between these two women that, as you said, had nothing to do with the, I mean, not nothing to do with, but it wasn't about the sexuality, it wasn't about the sex, it's about finding a person. And there's these beautiful scenes in this movie. Um, one of them, of course, What About Love? That number. Oh, I was so nervous! <laughs> I was like, I had to sing with her? Oh God, y'all tried to kill me. But she was so gracious, she was like, okay, I'll just find your note, don't worry, just do you. <laughs> I love her voice. She has a speaking voice, which, of course, she's obviously protecting those powerful pipes, honey. But she goes into this little, and it just makes you want to crawl up and just. <laughs> <laughs> but she just was so graceful and sweet. And, and what I loved is that we got to hold each other's hand, you know, because this is, this is her first feature film. So, you know, I was big sis on that, you know. And then she was little sis on, you know, helping me with the singing and everything and giving me the, you know, the confidence I needed and just speaking great things into me. Just So the, the chemistry that you see on set is really real. Like we've established in this, uh, this amazing sisterhood. <laughs> Blitz, our director, sent a um, picture of us last night at Critics' Choice and we, were, we looked so happy. We were just laughing, it was just a great shot. And he sent it probably to all of us this morning. He said, I just love us. And I was like, man, I can't even put it into words, really. I just can't even put it into words, but I'm just totally grateful. And I just keep thanking him because you know, he, he called me during the pandemic and was like, you're Taranji, you are our show. And I was like, I'm a what? I'm your what? <laughs> Why are we doing the color purple? It's, so it's already a classic. We're stupid. Why are we touching it? And then he explained, you know, from the perspective of her imagination. And I was like, oh, that's dope. You know why? Because we don't live in our trauma, black people. We don't. We we go through things. We've been through things. History, we know the deal. Still going through it. But baby, let them drop electric slide. <laughs> or, or go to church. <laughs> baby, listen. But that's what we do. We're vibrant. We're alive. And we don't wallow in the muck. And we don't stay stuck in our trauma. We don't let it consume us. Because if it does, we're dead. We die. So... We are resilient and be proud because everything has been stacked against us to keep us down and we just keep rising. And that's what humanity does. If you allow it, if you give it the space to breathe, and sometimes you have to fight for your space. <laughs> well, we used to that too. <laughs> Listen, we got a couple questions in the stack about fighting for that space. Yes. But I do want to ask this question um, from Mo Monique Guild. Monique Guild, anybody in here? Hi, Monique. Monique. <laughs> hey, Momo. <laughs> 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 Thank you for the perfect segue because this question, what gave you the fire to go for it? For uh, to be an actor, my career. Um, no, I did. No, you're right. Um, I didn't move out here until I was 26, and people told me, "Oh, if you don't make it by 25, you're just not gonna make it." I said, "Well, bitch, I'm just moving out here at 26." <laughs> So if that's true, I might as well go back home. You didn't want to mention that at 19, like you know what I'm mean, saying. <laughs> so you know, but. <laughs> You know, people project and things. But um, I had a kid and, and my son in my junior year. And, you know, that changes everything. 
because now I'm not just living for me. I have to get serious about life now. And so I was saying, yeah, I want to be an actress. And I was in theater department at Howard, and I was starring in a lot of the shows and everything. <laughs> but um, once I had him, it was serious. It was go time. So I'll never forget when it dawned on me that I could really make money off of this because Paula J. Parker, Anthony Anderson, uh, uh, Marlon Wayans all were at this at Howard at the same time. Marlon left because his, you know, the brothers they started writing the Wayans, whatever. Um, Paula, I went to the theater to see Tales in the Hood, and I didn't know she was in it. And I sit there, and she comes up on the screen, and I go, <laughs> "I passed her in the hallway yesterday." Like it made. That's why. You gotta see yourself. That's why it's so important. That's why I fight the good fight. I'm telling you, there have been times when I wanted to walk away. But I know this thing is bigger than me. And God uses us all however way he sees fit. In some way, this is how he's choosing to use me and I have to surrender. So, yeah. But I saw that and I was like, I can really make real money doing this so I really got serious at the time I was uh, majoring in um, musical theater but that music theory is a bitch. <laughs> it is like math and I'm just not wired like that I math is <laughs> I'm an actress <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I, it was time to really make a decision. You know, I was like, I have to graduate. So I switched back to drama, carried my baby across the stage because a lot of people um, didn't believe in me. They thought that I was going to drop out of college because I got knocked up. Um, they thought I was going to quit. And what I'm not is a quitter. And so I was like, okay, watch me, watch this. I did plays, pregnant every trimester, climbing ladders, choreography. Um, and when it was time to graduate, put that baby on my hip, and I walked across that stage proud because I did what y'all said I couldn't. Now, now, and well, stay tuned, bitch. <laughs> and they've been staying tuned ever since. Quite literally, what, 17 million of them, uh, some seasons of Empire? The number, the yeah. number one show on broadcast television, <laughs> not to mention a, an Academy Award nomination Thank with many you. more to come. Thank you. Yeah, they've been Thank staying you. tuned. Thank you. Well, tell me about that first. You, you come out to LA, mm -hmm. um, 26. Yes. Um, as, the, as the legend goes, you had $700. That's it. And, and a one-year-old. Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Isn't that all you need? Hey, that's what they say, because yeah. look, look at me now. <laughs> the, er, the early... The er, <laughs> now stop before we go to church in here now. <laughs> I mean, they gave us an hour and a half. I think we're allowed. I, I, I've been to some sher sermons okay. shorter. <laughs> okay. But, so yes, you, you come to LA and getting your footing. Mm. What was the key for you? And I know you've talked about it a bit in your book as well. And there's a great question in here um, also about fighting to get a manager. Mm. Yeah. Um, you, you talk about that in Around the Way Girl. If y'all have not read this book, it is life changing. Um, it's fantastic. So tell me, tell me a little bit about getting your footing in LA and, and getting those first jobs. How did it go? Okay, so when I got here, of course, I have a baby now, so I have to set up shop, if, if you will. I have to be able to pay the bills, maintain, food, put food on the table. I'm a hustler. I know how to work. I know how to earn a coin, honey. <laughs> so I, I um, got with a temp agency. I went in. I did the best performance of my life. I made them hire me because I needed insurance. <laughs> I kept the acting thing under wraps because you know everybody in this town is an actor and when you, when you go to corporate, they don't want to hear that shit. <laughs> <laughs> they don't care about your dreams. No. Like you have a one hour lunch break. It's actually really 30 minutes if you count. <laughs> and maybe a 15 minute break. So um, I had to set up shop so I knew I had to get a job first. So once I did that and I found somewhere for me and my son to live, my cousin at the time, I, I forgot to tell you, I, $700 is not going to get you all that, but when I got here, I, had, I stayed with her first. And um, my little cousin, see, inspiration, he used to come see me in my plays at Howard, and his feet would be like this, and he would be in the front row. Like, I would have to look over his head because he would be like right there. <laughs> 
But he was inspired. Like he wanted to be like his big cousin. And so his mom, his mother found him a manager. Everything happened. So like I couldn't script this better. Like I think too small. That's why you got to trust God. Because we just dream too small. I didn't even see the setup. So um, he didn't even pursue uh, acting after this. He was on a show. They had an apartment in Burbank. She said, come on out here. Because my father called and was like, I don't know why she's still here. She can't catch fish on dry land. She needs to be out there. She said, send her. Family threw a party. I got the 700 That's how I got the $700. And I, a friend of mine worked at an airline. I got a one-way pass buddy ticket. I knew I wasn't coming back. And um, I stayed with her. I had three months to get set up shop. Found the temp agency, got the job. On that third month, she was like, I'm leaving, and I can't have you and my little cousin out here without a car. I gave her my entire $700. She took me to the... Um, airport air auction <laughs> I got me a little Sentra um she it was like thirty three hundred dollars and I promised her I said when I make it I'm gonna pay you back and I'll never forget the day when I called her and I was like you ready for this check it's coming and I paid her back even more <laughs> yeah yeah because if no one is there to sew into you how how you know I Yes, you can sow into yourself, but it also helps when you have others to help, to sow in and help support. That's why, ladies, get you a sister circle. Men, if the ladies are good, y'all going to be great. You know that, right? You know that, right? <laughs> I was wondering, do you remember what the job was that got you that check? Or around oh, when it, that happened? It, it, was, um, it was my first series regular on this show called Life, uh, The Division on Lifetime with Nancy McKeon and Bonnie Bedelia, Lisa Vidal. Yeah, that was my first. And that was right after Baby Boy. Was, Baby Boy paid me Schedule F. That's like $60,000 before taxes. <laughs> I'm not amazing at math either, but. <laughs> That's not a lot. It's not. No. But let's talk about Baby Boy, mm -hmm. um, because this is also a classic. And for it to be, <laughs> for Yvette to be like this breakthrough character, if you will. I, I mean, it's interesting because it's a breakthrough. It's, it's this major role, but there were more breakthroughs to come. What does, what is, what does she represent for you? I healed myself with Yvette. Because I was in an abuse, if you read the book, I was in an abusive relationship and um, for so long I was claiming victim. But one thing he never did was tie me up to a radiator, chain me to anything, or hold a gun up to my head. I had free will to leave. I was choosing to stay. Yeah. So Yvette was kind of tough for me. Um, it was very um, close to my life the young love of my life. Thank God there was no uh, social media back then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so just, yeah. He, um, <laughs> but, you know, it was hard. I remember when I first got that script, um, cause I, you know, I didn't, I was nobody. I had to audition, but when I read the script, I, there were moments where I had to put it down and walk away cause it was just too close. And um, one scene in particular is um, where she dreams of Jody dying. Yes. The dream, that's how I told John that my son's father was murdered. I called him and said the dream came true. Mm -hmm. Because we were talking about it during the film and I was going, oh my God, you have no idea the dreams. And, and to be quite honest, as black women, black mothers, we have those dreams. You know, we may not, it's, it's always in the back of our subconscious. If my man or my son leaves home, is he going to make it back? So... That scene was very difficult. And John, God, he kept going in and out. And I'm just wailing. And I'm like, I'm, you know, your body can't register a lot of times when it's acting. Especially for earlier on in my career, I hadn't really honed my instrument. Now I can turn it on and off. Like, I can literally be in the crib. Ah! 
and they yell cut and I'd be like girl so wait a minute last night I was at the such and such you know because you got to think about it I'm not a musician where I have an instrument an actual instrument this is my instrument mm -hmm. so as a, as my, my job as an actor is to take the words that the brilliant writer wrote and make them pop off that page right and in order to do that I have to move out of the way Cause guess what? This ain't got nothing to do with you, girl. <laughs> you know, but he kept going in and out and in and out. And I'm wailing, and I didn't realize that my lips had cracked. I dry, I'd cried every salt piece of salt out of my body. I had no more water. I was dehydrated, and Cuba Gooding Jr. happened to be on set that day, and um, he pulled me inside. He was like, "Oh, make up." The lips cracked, <laughs> cracked. But, you know, if you are going to be of service to these, it's very spiritual, actually, what we do as, as artists. Um, and that's why you have to control it. Teach yourself how to control it because you will hear Fantasia talk about it. I've been saying it for years, but it's hard to carry a character's issues and yours. Mm -hmm. it's like something's got to give. Mm -hmm. And what helped me with that was being a mother because – when I left a set or an audition or whatever, I had to leave it out there because now it's homework. What we eating? I gotta watch. He gotta have his uniform ready for tomorrow. He we, he needs my one hundred all of my attention. He doesn't understand Hollywood. I couldn't bring it home, so I had to train my instrument to turn on and off, and I can tap into it and give it to you two two takes mm -hmm. because I've trained myself and I've been doing it long enough where I know where it. If I'm hot and I'm ready to go, can you bring that camera in? Let's get this out the way. <laughs> and then work backwards. But that's just years of working with my instrument. You know, do what you need to do for you. But I'm telling you, for my mental, it helps to be able to turn it on and off. Because I have to be able to live in there somewhere. I, I do that on set. Like, and I, I was, I'm so grateful that I was able to support um, Fantasia, you know, because I'm a leading lady as well, you know, but I know what it takes to play these dark characters, like, you know, even though this Seely had more light, but there were still difficult scenes to watch, and certainly to put your body back into that if you've been traumatized like that in life is really, is tough, and so on the days when she didn't have to stay there, I would be there to, like, Hey, girl, <laughs> laugh with me. Yeah, you know, to take her out of it so there's some kind of balance. Because we don't want to lose anybody in this, you know. <laughs> Cause that's how deep this stuff is. It's like, a, it's like you're, you know, I'm, I'm really funny about who I work with, too, because that's energy. Mm -hmm. When you're opening up your chakras and you're allowing this other care, you're wide open. You're literally why you're so exposed. So I'm very particular about who I, because I, you, I, I, I shut it down. <laughs> I'm very protective of, you know, my space. And so there are jobs I turned down because I just didn't feel like that energy would be of service to me being of service to this character. I didn't, I don't want anything in the way. How, how did you learn how to do that, especially early on? Because, you know, this town acts like if you don't say yes to everything, nothing's ever going to come your way again. At what point did you go like, no, nah, I don't, it doesn't matter. I, I will be all right anyway. I'm a firm believer in that what's mine is mine. And every blessing ain't mine. Sometimes it's somebody else's blessing, you know? Um... So I operate like that. If I feel like, again, it has to scare the shit out of me. Otherwise, I'm not doing it. So a lot of the stuff I feel like, eh, I did this already. I've done this already. When I first started, I had to be very clear on what I would do and what I wouldn't do because when you do something really well, they just start sending you everything. So it was Yvette, baby boy, and I was every baby mama in the hood. I was like... <laughs> I'm trained, dear, I'm trained. <laughs> Check off, heard of him? <laughs> Shakespeare? Yeah. Um, so yeah, then I thought, okay, great. They see me as a, a fully realized, incredible actress. Did Benjamin Button, I got about four more old lady scripts. I see. 
and I ain't even gonna count how many cookies done came my way. <laughs> so, you know, if I feel like I've done it already, I just go, eh, give this to some, this belongs to somebody else. This is somebody else's blessing. You can see that in the filmography. You can see the choices that you've made and the way you switch it up and the way that you're playing new people each time. Um, I mean, we could go chronologically. We could go all <laughs> kinds of different ways. But because we, because I mentioned it earlier, I do want to switch up to Abbott um, and v Vanetta. <laughs> because that that is, you know, this is now at a point in your career where You've done so many different types of roles. And like you said, a bazillion cookies come your way. And while Vanetta might be very stylish. She likes cookie. Cookie was her bitch. You, exactly. Mm -hmm. That is what is interesting about her. But she ain't half the mother cookie was, baby. Exactly. Coming up there asking her kids for money. Get out of here. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about slipping into a character like that. Because, you know, you obviously have done so much drama. Um, but we've gotten a chance to see you do more and more and more comedy. Um, what was it about uh, meeting with Quinta and, and her and, and, and basically working with her on this character, working with the Abbott team? Let me just tell you something. When I first moved out here, yeah, those years ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> Two. Uh, right. I came out here to land a sitcom. I came out here to be the funny girl. That's what I, that was my dream. Cause my cousin, my cousin was on a sitcom. A good friend of mine, Simbi Kali was on a sitcom, Third Rock from the Moon, from the Sun. She was on there. Um, you know, I had a lot of friends, not a lot, but I saw, I knew what that money looked like. And I was like, for this many hours? <laughs> like this is the perfect job for a single mother. I get to drop my son off at school and pick him up and be a mother, you know? and and they say, if you want to make God laugh, tell them your plans. <laughs> I was on the track to it as well because I started booking sitcoms, um, Sister, Sister, Smart Guy. Um, and then I booked Baby Boy. And from there on, it was all drama. So um, when I saw Quinta, we were doing that's my jam and we were backstage and I'm literally a fan of the show. I am in awe of her accomplishments and, and if I see a sister, I'm gonna be like, you look good girl, you doing, I'm, I, I like to you know, give people their flowers and so I told her I was a fan and I love the show and how proud of her I was and I was like, you know, any, if you need me to come over there anytime, I'm, I'll come, boy. I just threw it out there. I meant it real deep down, I did. <laughs> <laughs> And like, no, really, I, I, no, but really, girl, call me. Um, <laughs> and she did, like, two weeks later. And I, literally, and I said, hell yeah. <laughs> and to come and just have fun, like, yeah. And I, I saw the, the character, and I was like, God, this is so much like Cookie. Like, and I get it. I get the infinity for her. I get it. I get it. But I, I did it. <laughs> you know, it's been done. So... My thing was then how do I make her different? You know, maybe she is a fan of Cookie. Okay, then that's the way I can put the fur on, the leggings and be big and in life. But I had to find the subtle differences. Like she's not the the best mother. Like her story and how she cares for her daughters is very different. Cookie was a she gave up 17 years of her freedom to protect her boys, to break up, to keep them out of the system because if Lou I don't know if you all saw the show but in the pilot <laughs> in case it, you know in case you haven't in the pilot Lucius they both the yeah. sting was happening they both got caught they never showed the trial or anything so my backstory and Lee Daniels and Danny Strong was like bitch that's brilliant <laughs> My backstory was that she chose, she made that sacrifice for her family because remember, he had the voice. He had the talent. So if he went to jail, how was I going to prevent my sons from becoming statistics? Mm -hmm. A single black mother with three boys to raise in the hood. How was she going to prevent them babies from becoming statistics? Mm -hmm. So she took, the, she took the fall for the entire family. Vanetta, on the other hand, would have sung her daughter out. Then she did it. <laughs> like it's just a different the the essence of these women are, are very different you know but 
That's that's the brilliance. That's the character work. That's the mm -hmm. training that you have. Because now when I think about that performance, I absolutely see that. I can see Vanetta every every Thursday watching, sitting down, watching Empire. And ah! wanting, exactly. And trying to <laughs> be like present herself mm -hmm. like Cookie. Mm -hmm. But that's not inside of her. No, it's not. No, it's not. Like, come on, girl. Your daughter trying to make it from your raggedy ass and how you raise <laughs> And this one made something of herself. Be proud. And here you come asking her for her $5 she made. <laughs> Listen, we need to see you about five more times. I know this, this Emmy is for guest actress, but can, can we get a recurring? I know. We'll, I've I'll been call, working we'll, on we'll, it. Okay. I've been working on it. I li that's what I want. I want to laugh. It, it drives me crazy to have to play these. I mean, I love what I do. Let's not, let's not get it wrong. But I came here with a dream, y'all, and it, I haven't had it yet. Like, I still want my comedy. <laughs> I love... I love so much that the dream continues, yeah. though. I mean, I think that is something that's very inspiring that, you know, it's not from a place of lack where you're like, you know, where you don't feel like you've done enough, but that you still, despite all of these things that you've accomplished and these amazing roles that you've played, there is still that fire that, that Monique mentioned earlier that you just, it, it's for the love of it. It is. It is. Um... But I am getting to a point where <laughs> I just want to be ten toes down on an island somewhere, you know, because I'm the fight, you know, as a black woman, you know, we do it with so much grace and get paid half the price of what we're worth. And that becomes difficult. And it's a slap in my face when people go, oh, you work all the time. Well, bitch, I have to, because the math ain't mathing. <laughs> I wish I could do two films a year and relax the rest. I wish I had it like that. So because you see me working so much, I got to. You know, big bills come with this shit we do, okay? It, I don't do this alone. It takes a team. And they want to get paid for their work, as they should. So when you hear somebody making, oh, they made $10 million on this movie, well, you know Uncle Sam going to get 50% off the top, right? And then you got to pay 30% or however much you pay your team. So you really haven't made $10 million. So that's why that Benjamin Button story hit so hard, because all I was asking was for 500000 I wasn't trying to take nothing from Brad Pitt or Kate Winslet, uh, Blanchett. They deserve to earn what they get because they work their asses off for it. I so too worked my ass off. <laughs> and at the time, I couldn't say no. I didn't have any power because they would have been like, next. But I saw the bigger picture and I had to check my ego. And it was tough because I had to check it every day on that set. I had to check it because it would rise up in me and I would be like, Staying at the damn embassy suites. Now, let me, let, not the embassy suites! <laughs> Listen. And not, let me, let me be, make it very clear. They did give me money uh, to live on, but you gotta remember they only pay me this much. I got a kid, this money has to last. So I had to be creative like we are single mothers. We get creative with how we, and so what I did was instead of living off of that 10 grand they gave me to live up in some condo that I didn't, I wasn't living like that here in LA at the time. So I took that money and I said, I guess I'll just go to the NBC Suites. But it's all in how you look at it. And what I did is instead of get just let that anger fester and boil inside of me, I used it. I used everything. And I was like, well, this use this for Queenie. Because you got to remember, she lived in a small little room in the basement. So every time I came home to that room, I was like, this is her. You know, it helped my character. You know, I used it. But now, I, uh, give me my money. <laughs> I want my money now. <laughs>
Well, just like we said before, you use those roles and let them transform you yeah. so that other people can, can be transformed. And you've used that story mm -hmm. to help transform things for other black women in this industry and other women in this industry and other people in this industry in general. Because by making that clear and making that known, people now understand the math and when it's not mathing. Yeah, but it's still not mathing. <laughs> It's still not math, and I'm really getting tired of black women having the same story. It's breaking my heart. Like, 20-plus in the game, it breaks my heart. It's like every time you achieve something really incredible, it's almost like the industry looks at it as a fluke. Like, ah, oh, that was like some one-time thing. So you fall back to the bottom, and you got to negotiating that fight tooth and nail to get what you made the last time when where's my raise I haven't had, I haven't seen a raise in my income since proud Mary and almost had to walk away from color purple what? yes ma'am who said what <laughs> yes ma'am <laughs> yes ma'am because you know what if I don't take a stand how am I making it easy for Fantasia and Danielle and Hallie and, and, and Felicia? Then what, why, why am I doing this? If it's all just for me, what the, why are you here? We are to service each other. God is very clever. He put us on this earth and he made us all look different. He made it complicated. We need to figure it out. And we can, we can, and we are. You have to look at, look at the glass, it's half full. It's always half full. You are in every in every speech you give. I mean, in every <laughs> role that you take. I want to ask you real quick about Catherine, about Catherine oh. Johnson. We keep talking about math in here, um, <laughs> <laughs> but she was another woman, one of the, one of the many that you've played that really did that, that that really created the the space for us. Um, and did something incredible, and getting a chance to embody her, but also embody her while she could see you. Oh, I'll never forget when Ted Melfi sent me the script, and I was like, this is fiction, right? And he's like, no, this is a true story. I said, what? First thing I wanted to know, is Catherine still alive? He said, yes. I said, I have to meet her. I have to meet her. So I flew down to Virginia, and I met her and her family. <sighs> oh, God. Like, Regal, something about women of that period, the oh, back yeah. then and how they carried themselves. And she was still beautiful and sexy, quite sexy in her chair talking about we and us. That woman never said I. Yeah. <laughs> Think about the story though. Mm -hmm. All of these women in computers, there was no um, tug of war for power. When, when, when the big room needed a special talent, they found the woman who had that talent. No one kicked and clawed and, you know, uh, it's me, it's me. You know, it was a real sisterhood. I don't understand what happened. We used to stick together. We used to raise each other's kids. You know, if, 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 if the neighbor down the street caught you doing something, she could get you together. She could gather you. And then you'd come home and be gathered again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you got gathered because you were gathered. Baby, Ooh. listen, and you embarrassed me, so I'm going to gather you. But <laughs> I miss that. I miss being the innocence children used to have, staying outside until the, the lights come on and using their imagination, playing with clay and earth and dirt and catching frogs and watching them turn into tadpoles. The innocence is lost. Or not so much lost, we just have to fight really hard to keep it. And that saddens me. While you were talking about the we, though, it did make me think about that message that you said that Blitz sent y'all about how he loves y'all, how he loves us, mm -hmm. because that is what you've described. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love us for real. I do. Um, I mean, I don't know how many of you know I have a mental health um, foundation that I founded in honor of my father, <laughs> Vietnam. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and it was out of my own necessity that I started it um well 
my own necessity to find a therapist is what sparked me to start this foundation because I'm privileged. I can afford 350 or whatever it costs to see a therapist, usually 350 an hour. I can afford that. But then I started thinking, what about the, this entire community that one, don't even talk about it, and two, can't afford it. I, I can't heal myself and leave all these broken people out here that support me flailing in the wind. Like God gives you the mic, he gives you the stage, what you gonna do with it? And I want us all to heal. Like if I'm healing, we all need to heal, you know? <laughs> Um, and so I wanted to um, create space for that. I wanted to create space for us to talk about not being okay and to do away with this strong woman shit because that's what's killing us. You can't push through everything. You cannot. It is impossible. It is impossible. You need, you got to, I, I can't do it. I don't feel like myself today. You gotta do it. You have to fight for yourself. And so I just wanted us, I just at least, the first thing my best friend, Sister Seventh Grade, um, Tracy, she runs my foundation, Tracy J. Jenkins, and you know, she suffered from panic attacks since I've known her in the seventh grade. And we cried about it later, you know, once we grew up and we understood this thing called mental wellness. Um, but when she was young, we used to tease her, girl, you crazy. We would laugh, but we were ignorant. We didn't know. But then flash forward to us getting a better understanding. Now we cried about it because we didn't know, you know? And I just want black and brown people in underserved communities to be okay, to, to know that it's okay not to be okay and to just start talking, having these conversations because these conversations can save a life. I want people to know that they're not alone. There is no need for any human on this planet Earth to suffer in silence. It's too many of us. It's too many of us for someone not to identify with what you're going through. I'll never forget when I went to the Congress and I, mm -hmm. it was so freeing. It was so freeing because there were so many other celebrities that came up like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. But imagine if I didn't say anything. And so now this trickle effect started happening. And now I'm starting to see all of these athletes and these black men, uh, scrappy, say what you want. But he got on social media and he's talking about healing, his healing. I called Tracy, I'm like, girl, we did that. Yes. We did that. Cause, and I'm not trying to take any credit or anything like that, but I will say, I, I do feel like we did spark that conversation in a major way. And I'm so proud of us for the work that we're doing. Because we in these streets. <laughs> oh, we on HBCU campuses as well yes. with the She Care Pods. I was, I was just going to say, because Dr. Tamika Damon did have a question about, and, and, and oh, hi, <laughs> right here. Um, yes. Well, do you have any follow-up questions? Because the question was, um, you know, uh, congratulations, because your work with mental health care is so needed, are there any future developments with the organization to share? Is it, or do you have a new question? No, no, that was the question. I have a festival, I think I talked to you about it, about uh, psychology and mental health in the entertainment industry. And so what you're doing so closely aligned. So oh, yeah. I would love to, I would love to work with you. But I would love to know sort of what's happening with your foundation next. Okay, so the She Care Pause, the idea of the She Care Pause is beating people where they are, because you know you're talking to a community that's never dealt with mental um, health uh, conversations. So we're starting with putting them on college campuses. But it's crazy because when I, we went, Alabama State University was the first place we um, erected one. It broke my heart because the, prince, uh, the um, uh, president said, I wish we had this here two weeks ago because it would have saved two of our students. We can't get it out there fast enough. Yeah. We just, I'm so proud of the work we're doing. We erected the second She Care Pod at Hampton. We have two more universities to go. We have given out over 30 or 40 scholarships to black and brown children who are interested in you know, a career in the mental health field. We have to change the numbers because Okay, cultural competency and cultural, com cultural compassion 
is really what's missing. Um, if we don't have therapists who look like us, who understand our struggle, then certainly they need to be culturally competent and compassionate. And so we're doing work there by training therapists who are not black or brown to be sensitive to the issues that we deal with in life, um, everyday shit that they just miss. Um, we got to deal up uh, the state of the city of San Francisco where it's interested in us putting, because our goal is to put these pods on every corner in every city. Because if you ingest poison, you cut your foot, you have a headache, there is a drugstore every half a mile. Where do you go for your mental health? Why don't we have these pods on every corner? Maybe we'll see less road rage. When people are in crisis, they can't call a 1-800 number and wait. So, <laughs> We need these pods, and we need them now. And we are—we want them in um, un, um, in places like convention centers, on set, sports arenas, places like that. So that's the goal. That's our big plan goal. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, very much so. Mm -hmm. I love you that you say on sets as well too, because you've already explained a little bit, and I hope it's been um, en enlightening for the folks watching too. But you know, acting is a very deeply emotional process, and so you do have to make sure the mental is good too. Um, so we talk about these these roles challenging you and transforming you today. Do you have a favorite one? If you were to think back on all the people you've played and inhabited and embodied, um, is there one that's particularly close to your heart? They're all my babies. <laughs> I don't have a favorite child. <laughs> it's impossible to choose. <laughs> you, I, you know, I just, I love all of the women I've portrayed. Um, I feel like I'd be cheating if I picked just one. <laughs> And I've, 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 I, I handled them all with such delicacy and love, like each and every one of them are very special to me. So I can't just pick one. <laughs> and you shouldn't. Because <laughs> um, that would be the, the bad mother thing to do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Vanetta. <laughs> Vanetta would pick one. Yeah, she sure would. <laughs> uh, well, there was another question in here about the other Suge. Um, Avery. No, no, no. We've talked Shug from Hustle and Flow. Shook from Hustle and Flow. Yes. And this experience of, you know, working with Terrence, working with Craig Brewer. What was it about this Shug that spoke to you at this time when you, when you first read that script and, and, and that, that story started to come together? I saw her as a diamond in the rough. No one had spoken to her. No one saw her. She was sexualized, probably abused at a very young age. And her sugar story is Shug. You know, she didn't see herself as a sex worker. She saw herself as giving love. Mm -hmm. She had a pimp and he would take her money, but she would get in the back of them cars and do the things that she did because in her mind, this is what love looked like because that's, somebody did that to her. Mm -hmm. And she had never been seen and she never really heard her voice. So when she got in that studio and he played that thing back and she goes, Do you know how many people are out there like that mm -hmm. that don't know that they have a voice? So I, I wanted people to see her and just want to find the sugar in the world and go get her and, and pour into her and turn that diamond in the rough into a beautiful, fully realized gem. <laughs> I mean, uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Truly, when you go back and watch that performance, you, I'm gonna say I'm gonna sound like a broken record. You see all of those things. That is what you see. You see that moment when she has those headphones on and hears the playback. You see a life that was changed. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. She found her voice, and that's what we're all doing in this thing called life. We're finding our we're just, just just finding our voice. Some have it better than others. I'm still kind of working on it. So I'm trying to find the tone, the pitch, the tempo, the rhythm. We're all trying to find our voices. 
How have you found your voice through all of these characters? As you've, you know, you've talked about how each role transforms yeah. you a bit. Um, at this point in their career, what, how would you say that all of them combined have helped Taraji find her voice? I mean, I put in the work, you know what I mean? I put the work in so that I could have a voice, so that I could say no, so that I could fight for those coming behind me. That's all the work I did. Now you, now you just can't pay me anything, because I'll say no. And if you want me, you better dig down to them socks. <laughs> Reach past the pocket all the way down <laughs> to the sock. I want that money that you ain't trying to show me. <laughs> The money you have, I deserve it, you know? Yeah, and I got big bills. Remember, Uncle Sam is getting his 50 off the top. They'll always remember that. Well, since we're talking business, Kerwin Thompson did want to know, well, first of all, to say thank you for coming. Thanks for having me, are you kidding me? <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, but to also ask, what was the best acting business decision that you made. So whether that be representation wise. Firing everybody after Cookie. Everybody had to fucking go. Where is my deal? Where is my commercial? Cookie was top of the fashion game. Where is my endorsement? What did you have set up for after this? That's why y'all haven't seen me in so long. They had nothing set up. All they wanted was another cookie show. And I said, I'll, I'll do it, but it has to be right. The, perp the people deserve, she's too beloved for y'all to fuck it up. And so when they didn't get it right, I was like, well, that's it. And then they had nothing else. You're all fucking fired. I mean, I'm gonna say this though. It took me years to get there because I did have a bit of Stockholm Syndrome. Baby, it. it's very real. You are the prize, don't you ever forget that. You are the talent, you are their check. Don't ever forget that. They work for you, and if they're not, Somebody else will do it. But I had that for years because I stayed with the same team for years. And now I don't have a lot of regrets, but I, that's one thing I, but no, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that because God, the way he continues, mother, father, God continues to. you know, keeps blessing me, um, there's more to come. So I don't have to have regrets. I don't have, I know no regrets. I take that back. Yes. I take that back. Everything we go through is a lesson. Absolutely. And you're going to use it, and you have. You continue to use it. I mean. As long as you learn and you start making different choices. Now, it'd be different if I stay stuck with the same nothing as. You know what I'm saying? But I had to go through that to learn on my own. No one could tell, because people were telling me, give it in, fire this person, fire this person. No, I can't, they've been there for me. So I, I had to find it on my own. So that's why it all happened for that reason. Damn, that just came to me today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you answered this question. <laughs> uh... But, but actually, th this is a very important follow-up question because it is about the advice of when you're switching to new reps and getting them to gain that initial interest in you. I mean, obviously, in your situation, it's real different. We have all of the materials. Right. <laughs> it's like turn on your TV any day. And we, we know what they're going for. But for folks just starting out, what, what advice would you give them about finding the right well, representation? Well, when I first started out, <laughs> I'll take y'all, give you, you know, my, an example from my own life. I was here. I got here. I was green. I had no representation. I um, had my cousin who had the manager in Maryland, and he had the job here, my little cousin. She kind of helped me, so she threw out some agencies, and I met with this one agency, and they signed me. They sent me out. The first audition they sent me out on, 
it was a Norman Lear sitcom. And I went, the first thing they sent me out on, y'all, I went to Studio Re. I got a call back the same day. Studio Network, same day. They never sent me out on anything else. So guess what I did? Fired them. And I, I had nothing. But shit I did on stage in Howard University, nobody care about that here. And so, but I believed in me. And I knew there was space for me. I knew that my voice was needed in Hollywood because I honestly didn't feel like I saw me. They kept saying, oh, she too edgy. I was like, it's a lot of us out here. <laughs> uh, but also what you're missing is that I'm trained. So don't expect me, uh, when I walk in the room, I'm gonna walk in as me, okay? Cause I'm gonna be me. But I can give you whatever you want on a silver platter in, that, in the pages with the right check attached. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not gonna talk the way you want me to talk because this is who I am. But if I have to speak that a certain way, if it's in the pages, that's what you're gonna get. And it's gonna be served up, like I said, on a silver platter because I'm gonna do my work. But I'm gonna be me. I gotta be me. <laughs> and you're bringing, you're bringing me in as an actor, but you also are a producer. Yeah. You're a director. Mm -hmm. You are, you know, showing the world through that lens as well as you continue to explore behind the camera. What have you learned, um, one, about what you do in front of the camera, and also just, you know, how does it allow you to expand your creativity? I think as far as directing, it was inevitable. I, I mean, I think like a director, even in my acting, mm -hmm. I, I show up kind of knowing what I, you know. You play, you know, you have scene partners. I love great scene partners, um, so I, I I do a lot of thinking, like this scene, this angle, this shot, why is she saying it here? Why is it, say so I knew that that was, I knew I was gonna fall into that. I just have to find the time. I do have a um, script, uh, it's a black female coming of age story because when I grew up, all I had was Molly Ringwall. And to be a little black girl today, Jesus, y'all got hair products. <laughs> you got, <laughs> and and they are TPH as well. Well, I mean, that I know that too, was not why you brought it up, but, but I I get to plug. But you know, if T, if L'Oreal, Maybelline, Cover Girl, they can all coexist. So can Pattern. So can Gabrielle, Flawless, and and you name it. We can all coexist, right? So um, yeah, I said all that to say. <laughs> But um, I forgot the damn question. No, you were, you were, no, you were saying about <laughs> the world that, yeah, yes, oh, this coming of age it's story. It's a coming of age story, and it's very important to me. And um, Marseille is the star. <laughs> but the, the strike fucked up everything, and everything got pushed back. But she's still my girl. She's still my girl. Oh, this is going to be great for her. Oh, she's incredible. She's incredible. Her mother's amazing, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you mention someone like her, who is a, a very, a, she's a young powerhouse, but Autumn Hayes had a question about what you're excited for um, relating to this upcoming generation of actors, and are there any changes in the industry that you feel will benefit young black actors that you didn't have access to? Listen, it's, it's a new game out here for these babies with this YouTube, Issa Rae, anybody? Right, uh, even Quinta. You know, so what I'm most excited about is these babies owning their narrative, owning. They had to pay Issa Rae because she said she's presented it and it was like, you need me, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm loving seeing. You know, Marseille being the youngest producer like that excites the hell out of me. It makes me feel like my fight, my tears, my blood, my sweat was not in vain because I know them babies was watching me. <laughs> we, we was, are, still, am. Exactly. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Child, we probably the same age, y'all. <laughs> I did want to talk about, so th there's also the extra fun, too, um, when we don't see your face on the screen, but we do get a chance to hear your voice. Things like Minions, Rise of the Gru, and Paw Patrol. I mean, listen, everybody's watching Paw Patrol. I know. <laughs> I love Paw I watch Paw Patrol. My dog watches Paw Patrol. When I leave him home, that's what's on TV. Because you're a good there. mom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
Thank you. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about getting to kind of expand um, with voice acting as well. What does that allow you to do? I love voiceover work. I want to do more because I was a I was an only child. Aww. Yeah, and <laughs> you know the summertime would come around, and my mother, I'd be I have a huge family, lots of first cousins, but I would be the only one shipped down south for the summer. So I was hanging out with my grandma and her friends. <laughs> on a farm smelling getting that good whiff of that hog wind <laughs> playing with my fireflies making my jewelry so I had a lot of space to create and be creative I'm very creative I have so many characters that live inside I wish my makeup team was in here because they would be like child <laughs> <laughs> but I have all of these characters that live inside of me and at a given moment, a lot of people don't know this about, but in any given moment, one of them might come out, you know, I might start talking in this weird little voice, <laughs> but um, it's just my creative imagination and you have to be extremely creative in those um, voiceover because there's nobody in there but you, a mic, a light, and a screen. Maybe they have the, rendi the, um, the rendering of your character yet, maybe not. Um, you're, there's a, talking head on a computer usually the director's out of the country somewhere and then there's the guy back there working the equipment so all you have is your imagination and that's where I live because it's fun <laughs> no I'm telling you I please do not let the little kid in you die you have to fight and keep that little child in you alive. And I'll never forget when I was a kid, you know, we didn't have any money. And I would look through JCPenney's and Sears and I would wish and hope for the toys that we, I could have. And of course, my mother couldn't afford them. But I made myself a promise at a really young age. And I was like, I can't wait till I start making my money because I'm never going to tell myself no. I mean, I have control, obviously. But I spoiled myself. <laughs> but what I did was I, I also said that I want a little girl room where all my toys, all the things that I couldn't afford, and they're actually, they're not toys, but they're my grown-up toys, not sex toys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're in another room. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's focus here. <laughs> let's focus. Um, <laughs> toys are toys, exactly. Toys are us. Anyway, so... <laughs> I have a, a salon in my house, and that's where I play. When the world gets to be too much, I go disappear, and I play with my doll heads, and I cut hair, I color hair, I do nails, I create in other ways, because um, I'm that. I just I'm a creator. I have to recreate things. I just learn how to make shower steamers, and I love doing stuff like that. So that's my escape. When 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 I see something, when I scroll on, because I don't watch the news anymore. I just. I can't. My anxiety. I can't. I would never leave my house if I watched the news. So I stopped. But now Instagram has become the news. Like you can't help. You'll scroll and if I and if I do that, I put it down and I run to the salon. <laughs> As a I, I'm sorry. As a journalist, <laughs> it's listen. Sometimes I wish I could turn off the news. Yeah, um, I'm sure. But this is not about me. This is. <laughs> That's another night at a drink at a bar somewhere, oh, me and you. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I wanted, there was, there was another question in here that was, we were celebrating um, what we talked about at the very beginning of this conversation, the singing. The, the absolute oh just, God. you sang Girl, you in color not, purple. You become my new BFF. I, <laughs> I didn't know you could sing like that. Oh my goodness. That is Thank quite you. literally what Raquel said. I did not know you could <laughs> sing like that. And in quotes, Oscar worthy. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm just <laughs> That does crazy things to my anxiety. But uh, we won't talk about that. <laughs> but I want to talk about the singing because I do also want to talk about Annie Live too. So we oh, did yeah. we did get like a little teensy uh, like we got, a, we got an intro yeah. to then what you, you brought it on the big screen. You know, do you, how much did you enjoy getting the opportunity to, yeah, get back to those stage roots and oh do God. that musical theater? I feel most comfortable on the theater, on a on stage. That's where I really thrive. <laughs> because it's the only one time where you get to live the character story from beginning to end. You don't get that option in features, so. I, I love the stage. 
I'm coming to Broadway, no worries. <laughs> but I'm coming the way I want to come. I'm coming to shake shit up. <laughs> Okay, we can't wait, and thank you for knowing what my next question was. Uh, but you mentioned your grandmother. Yeah. Um, we've talked about your mama a little bit as well, your son. Um, I wanted to go back to 2019, when you got your star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I forget about that. Oh, yeah. You don't have time to just be walking around Hollywood Boulevard, just a little busy. Um, but you, it was just such a beautiful ceremony, and you talked in that piece about you know wanting to give back to your mom and how much your grandmother supported you and being able to have your son there. You know what does it mean to have this career and also to have them all been able to see it and be a part of it and you know live the dream together. The the most rewarding thing I ever get is when my mom calls me and she's like, I'm so proud of you. I'm 53. My mother still tucks me in. Okay. I'm like, Ma, would you go tend to your grandson? I'm good. <laughs> but it's just love. She's just, she is just the embodiment of pure, unconditional love. Anyway, um, she be reading y'all comments and stuff. <laughs> And she'll call and she'll say, I'm just so your fans love you so much. The things that they say about you. And I say, there's some haters out there too. Just don't read those. <laughs> but um, I live to make them proud. I'll never forget before my grandfather passed away. He was a sharecropper, y'all. Y'all know. For those who don't, it's one step away from picking cotton, living on a plantation. He said, I never thought I would live to see one of my own on TV. Wow. And he never missed anything I did. I remember I was doing some undercover work on the division, my character. That that I just, she can't fool me. She can't fool me. <laughs> and he would literally sit in front of the TV like this. <laughs> I miss him so much. But my grandmother, his wife, is about to make 100 in April. Yeah. And I'm taking her to see the color purple. And she's going to sit right beside me Christmas Day, and I'm going to look at all her facial expressions. <laughs> you knew I was just about to ask, because yeah. I was like, you know, that is, that is the beauty of yeah. this. You know, we are, we are all doing this as a community, mm -hmm. as, you have, have you, as you've talked so beautifully about in this conversation. And, and that's, our, that's our first community. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My family, and they were the first to believe in me. My dad, sp if you have children, just speak into them. Speak into them. They might not hear you now, but I promise you they're listening. They're listening. Because my father told me, when I, I didn't even know I wanted to be an actor. He just saw, I was a very rambunctious child. <laughs> Baby magic, just bouncing off the walls. Um, and my family knew how to channel that energy. Because I was a girl from the hood. What if I didn't have a place to channel? Where would I have been, ended up? And my godmother and my aunt, Norma, she passed away, rest in peace, um, put me in the, the Kennedy Center, had an acting uh, class on Saturdays. Uh, my mother couldn't afford it. My father was having his issues, probably homeless, la homeless at the time. But my godmother and my aunt, like it takes a village. Even though my father would speak it into me, he might not have been, you know, mentally there. But when he got it together, he would, oh, you're going to do this. You're going to, all of the stuff that I'm doing, he saw before he passed away. He told me this, all of it. And I believed him. And that's why you have to speak into your children. I don't care that they could be raised in hell. Pray over them and speak into their lives. Whatever they're doing, if it's breaking your heart, speak the opposite into their lives. See them on the other side of it. That's how powerful prayer is. Well, thank you. Um, not just for, for taking us a bit on the journey of your life and career, but for the journey of your life and career, because every single one of those characters has spoken into our lives, truly, by, by us seeing you on the screen, just like your granddaddy saw you on the screen, <laughs> has changed things for everybody in this room, and I'm sure many of the people watching at home, all the people watching at home, I hope so. Um, and we just, we thank you. We thank you, Taraji. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us.